Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas. Five down, 45 to go. Welcome to episode two of 50 for 50, the top 50 attractions in the history of Walt Disney World Resort. I'm your host, Brian Perry. We're here at Epcot, a theme park that has had a number of phenomenal attractions throughout the years. Unfortunately, some of them aren't around anymore, and some of them are on the way. They're sprinkled out throughout our list of the top 50, so let's see if any fit in between numbers 45 and 41 of 50 for 50. And don't underestimate the importance of the body language. We start episode two back in 2006, when Disney released the Platinum Edition DVD of their 1989 hit film, The Little Mermaid. Included in the bonus features was a virtual ride of an attraction that didn't exist, but was in the not so early planning stages. The ride that came just over five years later proved to be a fan favorite, but the comparison of the original concept seen on the DVD and what came to be with Under the Sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid, is both fascinating and maybe even a little disappointing to some. That's because the DVD's version featured a rail-suspended ride system similar to Peter Pan's flight and a much more in-depth story that included extremely detailed scenes not seen in the actual ride. Ursula's fate at the end and shipwrecks, along with our first look at an animatronic Ariel, Sebastian, and Flounder at the very beginning, plus an unbelievable effect of diving into the water face forward, were all scrapped in the actual ride. Despite not necessarily reaching its full potential, the attraction that came to be still proved to be one of Disney's best dark rides to date. In 2009, Disney made the still controversial move to demolish Mickey's Toontown Fair in order to expand Fantasyland and build Storybook Circus. One of the new elements of Fantasyland was the Little Mermaid attraction. While inside, guests explore the story, characters, and music of the Little Mermaid, one of the most impressive aspects of the attraction is actually its exterior, complete with the facade of Prince Eric's castle. Right next door is a meet and greet location for Ariel, and on the exit is one of the best hidden Mickeys in all of Walt Disney World. Under the Sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid is a colorful, fun, and pleasant experience, though one has to wonder how much more popular it would have been had the original concept actually been built. Welcome aboard the Disney Skyliner at Disney's Riviera Resort. Long before the Skyliner began taking guests from Hollywood Studios to Epcot, Magic Kingdom got in on the fun with an aerial gondola of their own. Billed as two separate attractions, the Skyway to Fantasyland and Skyway to Tomorrowland were strictly one-way ventures for guests to get a glimpse of the Magic Kingdom from up above. Colorful open-air buckets housed four guests as they hung from beneath a cable on their journey across the park. Opened with the park in 1971, guests had the option to either board A in Tomorrowland, where bathrooms are now located near Space Mountain, or B in Fantasyland, where, ironically, bathrooms are now located near Rapunzel's Tower. Yes, both Skyway stations are now bathrooms. While today the Tangled-themed bathroom area is considered an aesthetically pleasing area of Magic Kingdom, the Skyway Station, based on a European chalet that stood in the exact same spot, just might have it beat. While Disneyland's version of the attraction was famous for traveling through the Matterhorn, Magic Kingdom had one feature that was unique to Walt Disney World's version of the ride. It didn't travel in a straight line. No, instead, gondolas made an L-shaped turn out where the Tomorrowland Speedway currently stands. The cables and ride vehicles then essentially traveled over the pathway that currently separates Seven Dwarfs Mine Train and the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. The Magic Kingdom Skyway closed in 1999, but both stations remained mostly intact for nearly another decade. It wasn't until 2009 where the station 
portion of the structure over in Tomorrowland was demolished, and it was 2012 when we said goodbye to the Fantasyland station when construction began for the Tangled themed area. At Mickey's Fairhaw Magic, you will be immersed in the fun and fantasy of some of your favorite Disney stories, where you can see, hear, smell, and feel the adventure of Peter Pan, Aladdin, The Little Mermaid, and many more. Becoming a fan favorite for not only providing an entertaining 12-minute 4D experience, but also as a place to escape the sweltering Florida sun, Mickey's Philhar Magic opened in 2003 as part of the Castle Courtyard in Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland. Featuring Donald Duck traveling through different popular songs and scenes, the attraction has been operating for now 18 years, but how it came to be dates back to what stood in its place on opening day, 1971. The Mickey Mouse Review, an original attraction partially designed by Walt Disney himself, operated with 86 animatronics and featured a story that incorporated Mickey and an orchestra playing songs from different Disney hit films. Sounds familiar, huh? The review closed down in 1980. Magic Journeys, an old Epcot attraction that got booted for Captain EO in the mid-80s, and the puppeteer-heavy Legend of the Lion King. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Each had their stints in the theater before Philhar Magic swooped in back in 2003. Today, 486 seats fill the legendary theater that sits right next to Peter Pan's flight. If you think you have a big TV at home, Mickey's Philhar Magic screen stretches 150 feet wide, which equals 1,800 inches. I'll be looking for my own next Black Friday. With the building of Galaxy's Edge and the media coverage it commanded, it's easy to forget the anticipation following the announcement of a different Hollywood Studios expansion back in 2015. Just six years ago, Disney announced their plans to shrink guests to the size of a toy and let them roam free at the soon-to-be-built Toy Story Land coming to Hollywood Studios. Included in the expansion were two brand new attractions, Alien Swirling Saucers, and our number 42 ride, Slinky Dog Dash. Set to become the second roller coaster built at Hollywood Studios, Slinky's backstory was that Andy, the owner of all your favorite Toy Story toys in the original film, built together a coaster kit and is utilizing the character Slinky as the ride vehicle. The ride only reaches a height of 50 feet and a speed of 40 miles per hour, but includes two separate launches and is one of Walt Disney World's prettiest attractions once the sun goes down. The construction of the ride and accompanying area did spell the end for the famous Earful Tower, but we'll try not to hold it against Slinky. At the culmination of the ride, guests encounter an audio animatronic of Wheezy singing the hit song, You've Got a Friend in Me. The opening of Slinky and Toy Story Land proved to be a turning point in Hollywood Studios as prior to the expansion's debut, the park became known for its lack of attractions. Since opening Toy Story Land, Studios has now created three other attractions not including Slinky within the last two years that have cracked our list of the top 50 rides in Walt Disney World history. What are they and where do they fall? Well, that'll be revealed in the not-so-distant future. We welcome you to the living seas. We welcome you to Sea Base Alpha. It's been 14 years since the Seas with Nemo and Friends began taking guests into the big blue ocean world at Epcot. And while the current attraction remains relatively popular, it's the ride's original ancestor that takes its spot as the number 41 ride on our countdown. In 1986, the experimental prototype Community of Tomorrow welcomed a new pavilion on the west side of the park titled The Living Seas. Despite being planned for opening day at Epcot, the area and included attraction wouldn't see the light of day for another four years. At its opening, the pavilion housed the largest saltwater tank in the world, 
holding 5.7 million gallons of H2O. For its main attraction, guests would venture through two pre-shows, one of which was a film that showcased the formation of the oceans. Next up was riding a hydrolator, an elevator that brought guests to the sea floor. The hydrolator was actually a fake elevator, complete with a shaking floor and rising walls that simulated descent. Finally, guests boarded sea cabs, which are now clamshells in the Nemo iteration, and were taken slowly through the giant tank. Riders were brought just a mere few feet away from sharks and other fish, often never before seen from such a distance on a moving vehicle. Once off the ride, guests ventured into Sea Base Alpha, which was the normal aquarium part of the pavilion, where Turtle Talk with Crush is located today. Speculation on why the ride closed in 2001 ranges from a lack of sponsorship to the result of lack of tourism following 9-11. The ride remained shuttered until its reopening with the Nemo paint job half a decade later. Gone were the pre-show and hydrolators in favor of, honestly, one of Disney's most underrated themed queues. It's hard to believe that as we inch towards 2022, the seas with Nemo and friends will have been open for 15 years, thus matching the length of its predecessor, our 41st greatest attraction in the history of Walt Disney World, the Living Seas. <laughs>